Economic development, two words that mean different things to different people, whether it's a full-time job with benefits, new markets for ag products, or an overall strategy for state prosperity. We'll discuss economic development tonight on Speaking of Nebraska. Thanks for joining us on Speaking of Nebraska. I'm NET News reporter Fred Knapp. Economic development tends to attract attention mostly when there's big news, like Facebook building a huge data center in Papillion, or Charles Schwab buying TD Ameritrade and saying it'll consolidate its headquarters in Texas. But behind the headlines is policy, what the state's doing on subjects like taxes and education that affect companies' decisions. One big tool Nebraska's used for the last 30 years is tax incentives, giving companies tax breaks if they invest and or create jobs. But the biggest part of those tax breaks expires next year, and the legislature has to decide what, if anything, should take its place. First, we'll talk to two experts on tax incentives. Dave Rippey headed the state's Department of Economic Development until this August and now owns Queen City Development Company in Hastings. Renee Fry is executive director of the Open Sky Policy Institute in Lincoln, a think tank that's been critical of tax incentives. Welcome to you both. Dave, tell me briefly, how do these tax incentives, how are they intended to work? Right. Well, at a high level, Fred, uh, the Nebraska Advantage Program, for instance, was passed by our legislature in 2005 and utilizes income tax credits uh, against sales and income tax to help encourage a set of behaviors that the state has deemed appropriate. And so uh, primarily job creation and capital investment into our state and its communities. All right, well that sounds very reasonable. Renee, what's the problem with this picture? We don't know exactly what they're doing. There's uh, a lot of analysis that shows that Jobs that are created could cost as much as two or three hundred thousand dollars per fifty thousand dollar job per year, um, and it's just very difficult. There's not a lot of transparency around these. So, um, yes, ideally, that these are creating jobs and incentivizing investment. Um, the research nationally shows that a lot of these incentives are only incentivizing maybe up to twenty five percent of what we're actually funding. So the flip side is we're in. Uh, 75 percent um, or more of these ins um, behaviors would have happened anyway. So, so, so David, <clears throat> an expensive program that uh, encourages companies to do what they would have done anyway, or what's your perspective? Yeah, obviously there, there's two schools of thought on the deal, and likely with anything it's probably somewhere in the middle, Fred. Um, you know, when we look at the thing just directionally, the goal of the state that we all agree on is that we'd like to see more and better opportunities for Nebraskans. And, and Nebraskans say that uh, when surveyed by the State Department of Labor. And, and so trying to understand how we bring those opportunities to bear. And then the other thing we're trying to solve for is ultimately how do we broaden the tax base. And so encouraging capital investment, encouraging job creation, and then just trying to solve for how we get there. Let's talk about the wages that these jobs pay. Uh, the existing program allows credits for jobs that pay in as little as $13 an hour, but that would be changed under the new proposal. Uh, there, most companies would have to pay at least the statewide average of $22 an hour, uh, although smaller startups would have to pay what is the average wage in all but three of the state's largest counties, which is $19. Uh, Dave, is it important to gear wage requirements to different conditions in different areas of the state? Yeah, I think that it, it's highly appropriate uh, in understanding you're, you're trying to solve for, for many ends on the, uh, on the wages. And so uh, first and foremost, you'd like to be competitive with the other states that, that we're competing with for job opportunities. And so you try and balance that. But on the other side of that, uh, one of the main impediments for, for retaining people here is high paying jobs. And so you want to encourage a behavior shift that, that levels up the types of jobs and the wages that we have in our state. And so understanding how you remain competitive nationally as a state, how you encourage the behavior that you want to see, which is high paying jobs, but then also ultimately understanding what, uh, what one of the studies that was done for our legislature showed is that we have 
very distinct wage regions around our state, and so it's hard to go at it with a one-size-fits-all approach. Okay. Renee, is there a problem with uh, incentivizing low-wage jobs, in your view, and do you think specific industries ought to be targeted? So we should absolutely be focused on high-wage jobs. Every report that's been done in terms of economic development for the state has said Nebraska has a wage problem. We need to incentivize high-wage jobs. Um, under LB 720, the bill that is before the Nebraska legislature, the, low wage, the lowest wage that's eligible for incentives is between forty dollars and $44,000 a year, depending on which metric we're using. At that level, a family of four is still eligible for some government benefits. So um, we would say these jobs, maybe we should be even higher wage jobs than what would be incentivized under LB 720. Um, certainly an improvement over Nebraska Advantage, but I think we could do more. Dave, the current program is structured as an entitlement. That is to say, if you're a company and you promise to meet certain criteria, uh, you're entitled to these uh, benefits. Other states make it more discretionary. What are the pros and cons of those two approaches in your view? Yeah, so, so like you said, Fred, two, two different ways that states can approach an incentive program, uh, statutorily and on a discretionary basis. On, on the statutory side, what, what we've used here in the state predominantly, everybody's equal under the law. And so the legislature defines the behavior that we want to see. A company can then look to our state statute and, and know if they invest X or create Y for jobs, what the benefit will be. Um, that's, uh, that's what we've considered good governing policy in Nebraska, knowing uh, what that is without the opportunity to play favorites. Um, on the other side of it, a discretionary policy, in theory, uh, could allow a state to, to, to a greater degree, target its resources to negotiate incentives to, to engage in that type of behavior. Um, positives to that, certainly, but also um, the negatives of political perception or the perception of playing favorites. Right. I think you've mentioned in the past uh, New Jersey is an example of a state where uh, the two parties accuse each other, uh, each other's governors of having favored. Uh, yeah, certainly New Jersey's in the news right now. Um, the, the deal that the state of New York negotiated and structured with Amazon is certainly a popular one, and, uh, and that's in the news too. The state of New York officials would tell you that it was the greatest return on investment that they've ever calculated for an incentive program, uh, but that's not the news headline. Why do we need these kind of incentives at all? What, whatever happened to the theory that we ought to let the market determine where companies invest and, and grow? Yeah, well the problem is that, that we don't have an open free market system countrywide and so every single other state engages in some level of incentive behavior and, and so that has become the market the, and it's become the competitive reality of the market and so what incentives allow us to do is target precisely the behavior that we want to see without completely opening up our tax code. And so uh, using those income tax credits, sales tax credits to target a level of wage that we can agree on, a level of capital investment that we'd want to see, or even specific industries that we would want to see is a more cost-effective way as a state to, to be competitive with the states around you and target the exact behavior that you'd like to see. Hmm. Same question to you. Yeah, so um, I think we agree on probably more than we disagree on. And um, so, so the challenge is that having an entitlement program as we do with incentives is very expensive, right? So um, instead of just picking those projects that are going to be the most successful, have the highest return on investment, we fund everything. The legislature doesn't do that. They don't fund every project that comes to them. They can't afford that but yet we sort of have this open checkbook with incentives. And so we say, yes, we should have incentives, but they should be targeted. They should be, um, we should have discretion to pick those projects that are gonna um, move our state forward. And I think you can avoid some of the political issues by having a nonpartisan um, group of folks who actually review these incentives and make decisions so that we're only investing those best, best projects with the best potential, the greatest ROI, or that brings something really special to the state. But it doesn't need to be an open checkbook. Um, we can do this in a way that's a little bit more fiscally responsible. Is it an open checkbook because of the way the program is structured, in your view, Dave? Uh, in, in the fact that you, you set out behaviors, and if, and if a company engages in those behaviors and qualifies, they're eligible, uh, it could be viewed like that. 
But the fact of the matter is there, there are a number of limiters on it that, that say that a company must hire this many people. They must engage with this much investment. And, and that, that threshold, uh, isn't it currently at least 10 and it, in, in the, under the proposal it would go down to five? Is right. It? At the very lowest threshold, a company would need to hire 10 people and invest at least a million dollars under Nebraska Advantage. Um, and so really how you start to close that checkbook, Fred, is by the, the thresholds that you put in for, for applicability or eligibility. And there are such in the, in the proposal, are there not, Renee? Um, <clears throat> I mean, there are these criteria, yes, but there's no way to determine whether those um, behaviors would have happened anyway. So again, we're funding a lot of projects that would have happened without the incentives. Um, and so again, we, we're funding everything. There's an entitlement rather than some sort of analysis to say these projects wouldn't have happened but for these incentives, and so this is a good investment for our taxpayers. Well, I mean, what kind of uh, jobs would you, in, if, if you were in charge, exclude uh, uh, if, if they meet the wage criteria and uh, the number of jobs and the investment criteria? Uh, you know, who are, who, are, who are these experts that you uh, imagine to, to say, well, we don't want company A, but we do want company B? You know, I don't think it's saying we're, we don't want company A and we do want company B, but it's more of we, d we believe that these jobs are the jobs of the future. They're high wage, high benefit, high quality jobs that um, every report that has been done for Nebraska has said that we need, right? Um, and again, if you actually look at Nebraska Advantage, legislative performance audit finds only 16% of earned benefits are actually going to jobs which I think is an important policy question for us to be well, asking. What, what do you mean? What's the 80, other 84% going to? Against investments. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. So again, but, the, but those aren't jobs. Those are temporary jobs, construction jobs, perhaps, that sort of thing that may be done from, um, by folks from other states. But if we're focused on jobs, we need to say, okay, are these high paying jobs? Are they high quality jobs? Um, are we actually creating new jobs? Are we cannibalizing jobs from other businesses that aren't receiving incentives? These are all questions that can't be answered with an entitlement program. Dave, is there any problem with that you see with uh, most of the incentives going to incentivize investment as opposed to job creation? Well, I mean, there, there's a strong case to be made for incentivizing capital investment. Um, a, it broadens your property tax base. And so in a, in a state where we can't go into Kansas or North Dakota or South Dakota anywhere and, and annex their fields and, and annex their ground and, and claim property taxes from them, we have to figure out a way to build up and, and, to, and to add value in a more dense way, add tax value. And so... Uh, if you look at the $10.7 billion of capital investment that's occurred under the Nebraska Advantage program, what that has done is broaden the property tax base. That's one play. Uh, the other play on capital investment is that it encourages some level of permanency. And so you can look up to the Cargill campus at Blair and look at a billion dollars or more in capital investment and, and that plant isn't going anywhere. And, and even in the worst case scenario that we could look at and you could go to Cabela's in Sydney or TD Ameritrade potentially in Omaha or, or the ConAgra campus where we've encouraged investment there, that investment can't pick up and leave. And so it, with the TD Ameritrade building, regardless of what happens to it, you still have a building that's on the tax rolls at $80 million that generates $2 million a year in property taxes. The city of Sydney's still marketing headquarter buildings for companies to come into Sydney. And ConAgra is investing a half a billion dollars into their campus in Omaha. And so even in the worst case of scenarios, when jobs do leave the state, you still have a level of permanency and a level of investment here in our state. Okay. Well, that's about all the time we have for this segment. I want to thank both uh, Dave Rippey of Queen City Development Company and Renee Fry of Open Sky Policy Institute for sitting down with us. Thank you both. I'm sure this discussion will continue as the legislature considers these issues. This interview and tonight's program are available on our website. Just go to netnebraska.org slash speakingofnebraska. Join the ongoing conversation with our reporters and fellow Nebraskans on social media. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at NET News Nebraska.
Joining us now are Senators Mark Coulterman of Seward, who represents the 24th District in the Nebraska Legislature, and Tom Breezy of Albion, who represents District 41. Thank you both for being here. Thanks for having Travis. us. Senator Coulterman, why does uh, tax incentive legislation, in your view, need to pass this year? Well, first of all, the, the Nebraska Advantage Act is going to sunset at the end of 2020. And uh, if we didn't pass some sort of uh, incentive program like the Imagine Act, we would be without uh, a, a project in the state or without a program in the state. And there's 40, all the other states, every 49 other states all have a project of this nature. Okay. Senator Breezy, uh, this spring you were uh, among the senators uh, primarily re representing agricultural districts who uh, blocked the passage of the uh, proposed replacement for the Nebraska Advantage, the Imagine Nebraska Act that Senator Colderman was sponsoring, because property tax legislation hadn't passed. Why are those two issues linked in your view? Well, first of all, I want to thank Senator Colderman for his efforts on LB 720, and, and I look forward to the day when I can stand with him and support business tax incentives uh, legislation in Nebraska. But my support, as I've told Senator Colderman and, other, and others, my support for business tax incentive legislation is contingent on uh, first enacting meaningful and substantial property tax relief. And Fred, the reason is we have a property tax crisis in Nebraska. And if you travel the state, talk to ag producers out there, who uh, some of whom are drowning in red ink uh, because of partly because of uh, onerous and oppressive property taxes. You talk to uh, Main Street businesses who will tell you that economic growth is being choked off in their communities, partly because of high property taxes. You go to urban Nebraska and talk to homeowners there who. Uh, some of whom have 30 to 40 percent of their house payments comprised of property taxes, homeowners uh, who are uh, forced out of the housing market because of property, the fourth highest residential property taxes in the country. And you talk to business uh, owners who have difficulty recruiting uh, folks to come to our state, partly because of having property tax, residential property taxes 60 to 80 percent higher than the average in surrounding states. Excessive. Uh, unsustainable property taxes are uh, choking off economic growth across Nebraska. Senator Coulterman, do you disagree with that analysis? Or? Not at all. In fact, uh, Senator Breezy and I are both on the Revenue Committee and we've worked all, pretty much all summer long trying to figure out how do we, how do we get meaningful property tax relief. Uh, I wholeheartedly agree. I, I come from a, a rural setting as well and uh, we, we face those same problems. I think that probably the two most important things we will do in this session are pass the, uh, some significant property tax relief along with the incentive bill. And I look forward to working with my colleagues in that regard. Nevertheless, there has been this split uh, with, b between rural and urban on, on the approach to this economic development legislation. And I know you've said that about half of the benefits have gone to ag processing, value-added ag projects that help rural areas. So if that's been the case, why hasn't there been uh, a change in the depopulation of rural areas? Well, first, first and foremost, uh, our, you know, our urban areas, if, if you look at the, the young people come to Lincoln to go to school or they go to Omaha or, you know, they might go to uh, one of the smaller independent colleges in the state, but at the same time, most of those are on, on the eastern part of the state. You know, when you're young and you want to you want to get a good paying job, you're always looking. Well, where can I go, improve myself? At the same time, uh, we I don't think we've done a good enough job of uh, of promoting the fact that there's a real quality of life in in our rural areas. And I believe that the incentive package can help do that. And I think it has done some of that. But at the same time, uh, as as you indicated, about 48 percent of what we've paid out under the Advantage Act has gone to value-added agriculture. And that's good paying jobs as well. So, you know, you've got your ethanol plants, you've got your, your wind generation, you've got the, uh, the uh, Fortune 500 uh, seed corn companies that are, that are putting research in, into uh, rural Nebraska. There's plenty of opportunity. Uh, you've got uh, things up in uh, Columbus as an example, and you've got ADM, you've got Nucor. 
there's a lot of opportunity in rural Nebraska, except at the same time, you were young once, Fred, and you had uh, Can't recall. You, you looked at the idea, I want to move to a, to a metropolitan area where the bright lights are. That's human nature. But I think we can overcome that. It, but it's an educational process, and uh, I think with uh, the type of jobs that we're creating now, uh, they need to be more meaningful, more, more cost-effective, more better-paying jobs. That's what the Advantage Act has done. That's what we're really trying to do with the Imagine Act, bring that level of wage up. Okay. Senator Breezy, when you were discussing the property tax problem, which is your priority, uh, you, you described a problem across the board in various sectors, but isn't it the case that the ag sector has been the hardest hit by the shift in property taxes over the last decade? And if you reverse that shift somehow and, and distribute more of the burden onto the urban areas, <clears throat> won't that hurt the very uh, economic development that you're trying to promote here? Well, uh... <coughs> Ag has been hit hardest by the uh, increase in property taxes over the last decade or so. I believe agricultural property taxes have gone up in excess of 150 percent over the last 10 years. Compare that to urban and residential uh, property taxes who have, that have increased a fraction of that, possibly a fourth to a third of that, that much. So ag has been hit extremely hard. Ag has the third highest property taxes in the country, Nebraska ag producers. We have property taxes that uh, typically, on average, are about three times what they are in neighboring states. And so we, we talk all the time about, <clears throat> excuse me, trying to grow Nebraska, trying to uh, encourage young people to stay on the farm, but yet we saddle them with uh, property taxes three times higher than in neighboring states. We talk all the time about encouraging our young people to locate in Nebraska, stay in Nebraska, or, or encouraging folks to migrate into Nebraska, but yet we saddle our homeowners with property taxes that are uh, 60 to 80 percent higher than the average in the surrounding states. And I, I would submit that uh, uh, an unreasonable, unsustainable reliance on property taxes in Nebraska has a far greater detrimental effect on economic growth in our state than does the lack of any business incentive program. Incentives have been in the news recently. Uh, Omaha-based Ameritrade, uh, which is an outgrowth of the company founded by the governor's father, is being acquired by Charles Schwab. Uh, they're going to consolidate their headquarters in Texas. Uh, the company has gotten incentives worth more than $28 million, and I asked Governor Ricketts whether that was worth it, and let's take a listen to what he had to say about that. TD Ameritrade has created great paying jobs here. We want to keep those jobs here in our state. And frankly, an incentive program may help Charles Schwab be able to make that determination to actually grow their footprint here in Nebraska. We've got a great quality of life. We've got a great workforce. They've got people who are skilled in the financial services industry. So that's part of what we want to do is pitch them on expanding that, and maybe they might even be eligible for some incentives down the road. Breezy, would that be uh, throwing good money after bad to give Schwab incentives, in your view? Uh, it sounds like it could be, in my view. But, but again, th this really, this discussion really is an opportunity for urban and rural Nebraska to come together and do what's best for the state. And, and doing that, uh, and to do that, we have to realize the importance of business tax incentives to economic growth in our state well-designed business tax incentives, and we also have to realize the importance of property tax reform, property tax relief to economic growth in our state. What about you, Senator Coulter? I, I couldn't agree more. I, you know, I think it's a balancing act. Uh, you know, when, when we get elected to be senators of the state of Nebraska, it's not just for rural, for myself. I have to take a look at what's going on in the urban areas, and we have to develop the relationships with those urban senators. Uh, at the same time, they need to understand our challenges and our problems in, in rural Nebraska. I think that uh, you have two senators right here that understand that. We, we want to make those things possible. Um, Open Sky, <laughs> uh, whose executive director we had on before, has calculated that uh, the state has foregone more than $4 billion of uh, revenue over the last 30 years of incentives based on Department of Revenue reports. I wonder what, whether each of you think that was um, uh, uh, the best spending, uh, the best use of those dollars. Senator Coulter? Well, I, I would tell you, you can make numbers look however you want them to look. At the same time, we maybe have spent $4 billion, but we've also increased our, uh, our uh, 
value by 22 plus billion. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. So I would say, if 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 someone were to give me a few billion dollars and I in turn gave them 22 billion. That's still a pretty good return on your investment. We could make that transaction after that. I, I think you'd probably buy that, wouldn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Senator Breezy. Uh, well, one thing that's always troubled me about any type of incentive program uh, is the causation issue, and I think uh, Renee Fry uh, alluded to that earlier, the but-for test. You know, is this business or are these, are we incenting activity that would have occurred anyway even without the incentive? And it's difficult to tell that. It's extremely difficult to tell that. You design a program uh, so you can attempt to ensure that we're actually incenting business as best as possible and not throwing away money uh, towards uh, companies and investment that would have occurred anyway. So, so the causation test is really uh, uh, one of my biggest concerns about an incentive program. Be that as it may, as I indicated earlier, I, I, the business incentive programs that we're talking about now, a well-designed business incentive program, is critical to the growth of our state and the future of, future of Nebraska. Senator Kulterman, we just have a little bit of time left, but in 30 seconds or so, uh, is there a point at which these incentive uh, programs morph into corporate welfare or even socialism, and is that a problem? Well, first, first and foremost, I think you need to understand that when, when we start uh, when we, when people come into the state of Nebraska and they start looking at what we have to offer, they, they also are very, very much aware of what our tax structure is. We're not a, we're not a good tax structured state, as a whole. But I think that w if, if we didn't have these incentives, uh, we would be left in the cold. We, we wouldn't have the forty some thousand new jobs that we've created. We wouldn't have the investment of twenty. 22, 23 billion dollars that we've created just since the Advantage Act. So we have to have those. Senator Breezy, uh, real quickly, uh, what are the prospects that this deadlock is going to be broken this year? Uh, I'm cautiously optimistic. Uh, I, I think the, the stars have aligned to get this done. The question is going to take significant and substantial property tax relief to bring along uh, this block of senators who has uh, made their vote on business incentives contingent upon property tax relief. And so we'll have to see what type of a program we come up with. It's up to us in the Revenue Committee, uh, I believe, to design uh, t a property tax program that uh, will entice or will bring along this uh, block of senators and uh, move this forward as a package deal. Very good. Senator Tom Breezy, Senator Mark Coulterman, thank you very much for joining us today. Lawmakers will return to the Capitol in January for the legislative session. We'll cover the session each weekday on NET Radio and on netnebraska.org slash news. That's all for this edition of Speaking of Nebraska. Thanks to Renee Fry, Dave Rippey, and Senators Tom Breezy and Mark Coulterman. Speaking of Nebraska, we'll be back this spring for another season. Until then, I'm NET News reporter Fred Knapp. Thanks for tuning in.